Shalom, everyone. In the Nazarim, that's what we're called. There's something for the masses to see, and then there's something for the initiated to see. It's the darkness hiding in open view. We call them Wiccans, witches, warlocks, wizards, shamans. That's what they go by. It's poison doctrine. It's uh, wonderful to see all of you here. We want to welcome you. And uh, this is a seminar today that will be about an hour long. And I hope I can keep you awake. But it's on the war in heaven. And it's going to hopefully help destroy or, you know, tear down some false reasonings. And uh, it's going to be basically about the throne on our hearts. We talked about that a little bit. Who's sitting on the throne of our heart? Uh, many of us have unthroned ourselves, and we've put another in place on our throne. And that, in some cases, in fact, in most cases, it's uh, an imposter. It's not the true creator because the, the, there's an imposter that has stolen the identity and everything that belongs to the creator not only does he rule the world right now, but he rules the hearts of men and women by deception. And he's taken by, you know, being an imposter and a thief, stolen the very words that we're taught, that Yahuwah spoke himself because we've removed his name, you know. And the war in heaven is all about that because the one that was fallen, the one that was the covering Malachim or the angel around the throne, the second most important being in the universe was receiving worship as if he were Yahuwah himself. And that's what this pride that he received, he, it, it became all about him. See, selfishness, and that leads to pride. And then he carried a third of the hosts or the armies of heaven after himself by deception. Now, our minds, which is also our lamp, our inner self, and our heart. Those are three interchangeable things. The lamp of, of, our, of our body is, is, is our heart or our mind. It's the same thing. These are interchangeable words. Now, it's the battleground. People think that the adversary is at work to conquer the universe. And that is true. However, he has to enthrone himself. And that's what he's seeking to do. And has been very successful, by the way. And that is uh, going to be brought out by many scriptures that we're going to be bringing up. And we want to thank you for opening our minds and hearts to the fact that as Nazarene, or watchmen, we're his followers because we call him by his name and we obey his covenant. Now, um, we're going to start with two things right here. The uh, traditional terms and the authentic Hebrew terms. And right here before our eyes, we're seeing part of the deception. Because the one enthroned in our hearts, if we're deceived, we're using these terms or terms that are alternate terms than the real authentic terms. Because this is the truth and this is the error. L-O-R-D is a translation of the Hebrew word B-A-A-L. And that's what it means. If you look it up in Webster's, B-A-A-L means Lord. The translators started off with that at the tip of their, their false sword. Yahuwah, yod Hey uah Hey, that's the name. Uh, and J-E-S-U-S is, is another name. It, it means the horse in Hebrew, but in, in reality, it's supposed to mean Yah is our deliverer. So we're going to use the word Yahusha, the real name, or Yahushua, which is used twice in the, in the Tanakh. And we're not going to use the Greek. We don't need the Greek. We can go right straight back to the Hebrew, Mashiach. And G-O-D, we're going to look at that a little closer, but G-O-D is the, is the name of the sun deity to the Norse in the Scandinavian areas. And the, the a tribe that we call the Jews is originally called Yahudim, the worshipers of Yah and the royal tribe of the 12 tribes of Israel. And we're going to call ourselves by what scripture actually calls us, that we called ourselves, and that's not serene. We can be accused of being Christians by others, but we're actually calling ourselves by the Hebrew term, Nazarim, which is actually a prophetic term from Yermiyahu or Jeremiah 31, verse 6. And also we're named that, uh, or we're called that by Tertullian in uh, 
Tertullus in Acts 24, verse 5. And Yisrael refers to basically all the tribes descended from the man, Yaakob, who's called Jacob. And uh, actually, it also is a term used for the scattered ten tribes that the Assyrians scattered into the world around 722 BCE. And the Nazarim, the word Nazarim is from the word Nazar, and it means guardians, watchmen, or branches, as in the descendants of teachings. Now we're going to go through this real quick and uh, realize that he's the root of the teachings, Yahusha, and we are the branches of his teachings. Now there is a war in heaven, and that's what we were going to be discussing today. And it's over the designation of ownership. In, in a way. Uh, somebody has taken over and enthroned himself in the position of Yahuwah on this planet. Sometimes when you see the Pope sitting in his throne, you think, well, that's the physical representation of the leader of the earth, you know, and that's what he thinks he is. Uh, but actually, in th the real throne that you, Scripture wants us to understand that isn't, isn't a man-made throne. It's actually in our bodies. It's the throne of our hearts or our throne of our minds. In Matthew 23, it says, See, your house is left to you laid waste. For I say to you from now on, you shall by no means see me until you say, Baruch haba Bashem Yahuwah. Blessed is he who is coming in the name of Yahuwah. And you can also see that that is a prophecy from Psalm 118. Psalm 80 is critical to this because this is our cry of Ephraim. Ephraim being the lead tribe of the scattered tribes, which we're appealing to. And that is, let your hand be upon the one at your right hand, upon the son of Adam, whom you made strong for yourself, which is a ref reference to the resurrection of Yahushua. And we shall not backslide from you. Revive us and let us call on your name. Turn us back, O Yahuwah Elohim of hosts, and cause your face to shine that we might be saved. Now that Elohim of hosts, the word hosts is the Hebrew word saba, which means armies. So that's a reference to a war. We're soldiers, and we have weapons of warfare. Our armor, the armor of light, and we're going to look at that a little bit later. We're going to start off with the primary weapon in our war. And that is the tip of the sword. The tip of the sword is the identification of who he is. And that's his name. Here it is. The tip of the sword. I put a sword up there. The whole battle plan is going to unfold right here. And you're going to see the importance of his name in more than one of these commandments. The first commandment is, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. That's the tip of the sword. Now, if somebody comes along and changes that, and takes another word and puts it in there, then they have supplanted and put an imposter in. Who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, of, out of the house of bondage, you have no other mighty ones against my face. Number two, you do not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of which is in the heavens above or which is in the earth beneath, or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, Yahuwah, your Elohim, am a jealous El, visiting the crookedness of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing kindness to thousands, to those who love me and guard my commands. Number three, you do not cast the name of Yahuwah, your Elohim, to ruin, for Yahuwah does not leave him unpunished who casts his name to ruin. Number four, Guard the Sabbath day to set it apart as Yahuwah, your Elohim, commanded you. Six days you labor and shall do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahuwah, your Elohim. You do not do any work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, so that your male servant and your female servant rest as you do. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim, and that Yahuwah your Elohim 
brought you out from there by a strong hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, Yahuwah, your Elohim, commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. And that's also a covenant sign of the, of the eternal covenant, Ezekiel 20. Number five, respect your father and your mother as Yahuwah, your Elohim, has commanded you so that your days are prolonged and so that it is well with you on the soil which Yahuwah, your Elohim, is giving you. Number six, you do not murder. Number seven, you do not break wedlock. Number eight, you do not steal. Number nine, you do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Number 10, you do not covet your neighbor's wife, nor do you desire your neighbor's house, his field, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, his ox, nor his donkey, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. And then it continues in Deuteronomy 6 and says, Hear, O Yisrael, Yahuwah, our, Elo your Elohim, our Elohim, Yahuwah is one. And you shall love Yahuwah, your Elohim, with all your heart and with all your being and with all your might. And these words, which I am commanding you today, shall be in your heart. And you shall impress them upon your children and shall speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way. And when you lie down and when you rise up and shall bind them as a sign on your hand. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, the first to state his own case seems right until another comes and examines him. In other words, you can go back into the scriptures and see that the translators who stated their case first, they have made mistakes and errors, and they seem to be all being led by an entity that has misguided them. And they even say that traditions are the reason that we do these things. The world system indoctrinates people in order to entrap their minds. And you're a prisoner of your own beliefs if you've been misguided by false beliefs. And you're set free only by the truth. Here's a little fellow sitting on a bench that kind of gives the example of where we're, where we're going. It, he's saying, they call you all sorts of different names. Does that even matter to you? And then I just made this up, but uh, it might be that the rabbi or our rabbi would say, I'm glad you care enough to ask. My identity was stolen long ago, and I'm using that problem to learn who will seek me with all their heart and get to know me. Now, here's uh, the word G-O-D. We're going to look at that real briefly. We use the true personal name of the creator. The term G-O-D is an adopted word from former sun worshipers. This is what the Encyclopedia Americana says in, from the 1945 edition. G-O-D is a common Teutonic word for personal object of religious worship, formerly applicable to superhuman beings of heathen myth. On conversion of Teutonic races to Christianity, the term was applied to the supreme being. Of course, people understand that the supreme being is the creator. But the, the real thing we're going to try to point out in this seminar is that there's another imposter that's posing to be the supreme being. Now, in uh, one place in the book of Joshua, chapter 11, we, his real name is Yahusha, actually, uh, there's a term, B-A-A-L-G-A-D, which is actually translated L-O-R-D, or Lord, G-O-D. And that's what people use today. And, you know, they left it out. Uh, they're, 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 uh, I mean, that's in the translation, but that's interesting that they've adopted that when it's coming from, you know, a Canaanite city. Now, the revelation of the name is given specifically in a text. Exodus or Shemoth chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. And Moshe, that's Moses, said to Elohim, See, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The Elohim of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And Elohim said to Moshe, Ahaya, Asher Ahaya. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of, of Israel, Ahaya has sent me to you. And Elohim said further to Moshe, Thus you are to say to the children of Israel, Yahuwah, 
Elohim of your fathers, the Elohim of Abraham, the Elohim of Yishak, and the Elohim of Yaakov has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my remembrance to all generations. Now, the word Ahaya is, means the one who exists, and it is really not his name, but it's the root explanation that leads up to the revelation of his name. And that name is Yahuwah. It's used at least 6,823 times in the Tanakh. That would be the Old Testament to Christians. Now, as Nazarim, we do two primary things. It, the book of Revelation says that the first fruit group, the first fruits, are those who, hold to the, who, who obey the commandments of Yahuwah, and they hold to the testimony of Yahusha. So we guard his word, and that's his covenant that we just read, and his name. We guard those things. Now, the word guard in Hebrew is shamar, and it means to watch over carefully. And we guard his covenant very carefully. And we also guard his name. That name is written in modern, uh, modern Hebrew with four letters, and then the original script shows it in a different shape for the letters and it's his personal name it's a proper name that he calls himself he has one name and all the other names that you might be told about they have modifiers on them that's all those are there like yahusha is also a name his name with a modifier yah is our deliverer and from luke 11 when we have the disciples prayer we, we, we read these words kodesh which means set apart be your name. Your will, which is his Torah, his covenant, his instructions or commandments, be done on earth. Some people use extra letters, and we're going to look at those two things. Today we see people spelling the name with English or Latin letters, you know, Yahuwah with a W. But sometimes, uh, you know, it's better to use simplicity because that's a complication. See, a W is a double U. And it is a new letter. It just came into existence in the 13th century. So why do we use the simpler spelling? It's to cut away what is unnecessary. That's all. But we're not condemning anyone. We're just showing them that you can do the same thing by just using the, you know, the simpler spelling. All you need is the U because that's what it really is. The, the letter V and the letter W come from the letter U. Now, that's what it looks like, and there's a breakdown. You that may be watching this on a DVD or the Internet, you can see where these things evolved. V is really not a V in Latin. It's a U. The, the, sword, the word sword is gladius, and, it, and it's spelled with a shaped letter like this, you know, the third letter from the end. But it's used as an, you know, a U, and it's the same shape. Uh, well, it's a little different from the epsilon, the Greek epsilon, is actually the origin of this letter. It just lost the stem, you see. Now, the prophet Hosea, or Hosea, or Husha, in chapter 2 said, and it shall be in that day. Now, in that day refers to a very latter day thing, like the end times. Declares Yahuwah that you call me my husband. That's Ishi. And no longer call me my B-A-A-L. And I shall remove the names of the B-A-A-Ls from her mouth. And they shall no more be remembered by their name. So there's going to be a time when we're going to stop using that word, L-O-R-D. We're going to start calling him by his real name. And a pure lip is going to be restored. If you look at Zephaniah verse, uh, chapter 3, starting at verse 8, it says, Therefore, wait for me declares Yahuwah, until the day I rise up for plunder, for my judgment is to gather nations, to assemble rains, to pour out my, on them my rage, all my burning wrath. For by the fire of my jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. For then I shall turn unto the peoples a clean lip, so that they all call on the name of Yahuwah to serve him with one shoulder. Now, uh, the man we call Paul, before his conversion, as he approached Damascus, he was knocked down. From All of his people with him were knocked down. And as he was knocked down, he asked for the identity of the one who was speaking to him from this bright, blazing light. 
At Acts 20, 26, verse 14, we read this. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, which is a reference to the pure lip, Shaul, Shaul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the prods. And I said, who are you, master? And he said, I am Yahusha, whom you persecute. Now, what would be the language of the brief Kadashah? Well, it would be Hebrew, not Greek. Now, if we change those words into Greek or alter them or move them around, we're not doing the right thing. At the heart of the matter, though, is we are combatants. If we're immersed in the name of Yahusha, we're actually combatants in a war in heaven. And we entered that when we made our pledge at our immersion. It's a struggle over the identity of who we worship. And the objective involves the greatest stronghold of all. And this is a real big one to overcome. It's, it's really hard. It's harder to overcome this stronghold than Christmas or the Bunny Rabbit Festival or the day of the week that we're supposed to rest on. It's harder than any of those things. It's the name. And an identity thief or imposter is pretending to be the Elohim of esteem. And you're going to see the scriptures that back that statement up. The ultimate question is, who is the sovereign of esteem? Now, the word in uh, the Psalms, and, some, and I think in the book of Habakkuk, this word is used at the end of some of the Psalms are in order to inject emphasis. And there's two interpretations about this word. Salah. Salah means something that's highly important. Now, there's two theories about it among the teachers of you know, the scriptures. One is that it's a musical term instructing the singer to play louder, to play really loud, to emphasize the importance of what ex is expressed. But the other is that it's a word that is actually supposed to be spoken that emphasizes the great importance of what was being expressed. Now, whatever the case may be, salah is the equivalent of the word savvy that you hear in that, uh, what is that movie with um, Captain Jack Sparrow says, savvy. It means, do you understand? It's highly important that you understand. Now, the enemy is an identity thief and an imposter, and he receives worship by deception. Revelation 14, verse 6 says, And I saw another messenger flying in mid-heaven, holding the everlasting good news, that would be the Besorah, to announce to those dwelling on the earth, even to every nation and tribe and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Salah. Fear Elohim and give esteem to him because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made the heaven and the earth and sea and fountains of water. You hear the, uh, the word the esteem is used in here. Who is, the, uh, who is the sovereign of esteem? Who is it? Well, what is his identity? Is it B-A-A-L, Lord? Or is it Yahuwah, our Elohim? Now, the prophet, they call him Elijah or Eliyahu. He fought a battle of this war in heaven. It was one battle in the minds of people one day at Mount Carmel. Okay? Do you want to get the name right? If, what if he had said the wrong name after they had been going around all afternoon and cutting their bodies? And what if, he, if Elijah built this altar and put the sacrifice on it, and then poured water on it, and then used the wrong name. <laughs> what would have happened? Now, it says in Psalm 138, I bow myself toward your set-apart heckel, that's temple, and give thanks to your name for your kindness and for your truth, for you have made great your word, your name, above all. Those two things are above all else. And that's what Nazarene are defending. That's why we keep emphasizing that at the beginning. His word 
and his name. Now, in Yael, or Joel chapter 2, it says, And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of Yahuwah shall be delivered. For on Mount Sion and in Jerusalem there shall be an escape, as Yahuwah has said, and among the survivors whom Yahuwah calls. That's uh, also from Acts 2, verse 36. So Yahuwah is used a lot in the, in the, in the Tanakh. But the emphasis here is that the word Lord comes from the Hebrew word B-A-A-L. That's the definition. Now the message of Eliyahu, the prophet Elijah, confronting the people to identify the name of the one that they served. It says in 1 Kings 18, starting at verse 24, And you shall call on the name of your mighty one, and I, I call on the name of Yahuwah, and the Elohim who answers by fire, he is Elohim. So all the people answered and said, this word is good. And in 1 Kings 18, verse 20, it says, Ahab then sent for all the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets on Mount Carmel. The prophets being about, I think, um, 850 of them, I guess. You know, prophets of B-A-A-L, and A-S-H-E-R-A-H. And Eliyahu came to all the people and said, how long would you keep hopping between two opinions? If Yahuwah is Elohim, follow him. And if B-A-A-L, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. Now, have your teachers been making excuses about the name? Well, we speak, we speak English. Or we, we see it in Greek this way. This, this word curios is the one. That's, that's what the apostles wrote down. Well, translators shift the worship to this deity, B-A-A-L, who is actually the adversary. In 1 Kings 18, it says, and when all the people, now this is the King James Version. This is an example of how the translators fool us. And when all the people saw it, that's, they saw the fire fall when he said the, the name Yahuwah. And they saw it and they fell on their faces and they said, the L-O-R-D, he is the G-O-D? No, that's not what they said. That's not at all what they said. The text says, they said this, Yahuwah, Hua ha-Elohim. That means Yahuwah, he is the Elohim. That's what it means. And they said it twice. In John 17, which is the, you know, the place where Yahusha is, re, is, is praying, the high priestly prayer for all of us, he says, I have revealed your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have guarded your word. See that? He's talking about the name, and he's talking about the word. <laughs> That's the covenant. See Psalm 138, verse 2, where it says, you have made great your word, your name, your name above all. The battlefield is in the mind. It's who sits on the throne of the hearts, not who, who's, sitting in the, who's sitting on the throne of the Vatican. The throne in the Vatican is impertinent. The throne of men's hearts is where the real battlefield is. It's the same thing as the mind. As in the days of Eliyahu, the battle remains a rivalry over the name of the one we serve. Acts 2, 36 says, Therefore, let all the house of Yisrael know for certain that Elohim has made this, Yahusha, whom you impaled, both Master and Messiah. And having heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Kepha and the rest of the emissaries, Men, brothers, what shall we do? And Kepha said to them, Repent and let each one of you be immersed in the name of Yahusha. Messiah for the forgiveness of sins and you shall receive the gift of the set apart spirit for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off as many as Yahuwah our Elohim shall call. So if we're misled by the beast and, and the woman riding the beast then we're going to be going by the teachings from a strange woman who holds a cup in her hand full of doctrines that he, she's made the whole, all the nations of the earth drunk with these doctrines. And her name is Babel, or Babel. 
And she's also known by the C-I-R-C-E today, which is a Greek deity of a, of a sorceress of wine, uh, basically uh, pharmakia, a drug sorceress. She would make men drunk with drugs and make them believe they were animals. Um, she's also known as the mother of harlots. So there's a liar and a deceiver running rampant. Um, she's a counterfeit, an imposter, a supplanter, and has a, a system of false worship. Now, if your heart is set on Yahuwah, Jeremiah 16 says that you're going to realize this in the last days. O oh, Yahuwah, my strength and my stronghold and my refuge, in the day of distress, that's the day of tribulation, the Gentiles shall come to you from the ends of the earth and say, our fathers have inherited only falsehood, futility, and there is no value in them. Would a man make mighty ones for himself, which are not mighty ones? Therefore, see, I am causing them to know. This time I cause them to know my hand and my might, and they shall know that my name is Yahuwah. It's interesting because Yeshayahu, or Isaiah, in chapter 52 uh, if you read that whole chapter after this seminar and then read Psalm 80, you know, Psalm 80 is the cry of Ephraim in the last days. That's us. And, and Yeshayahu or Isaiah 52, the whole chapter. One sentence in there is, says, my people, my people shall know my name in that day for I am the one who is speaking. See, it is I. So uh, that's a very important thing. Now, if you say, it doesn't matter what we call him, he knows our hearts, he knows who, who we mean. Well, that's a big clue that something is very wrong. So, uh, actually, what we set our hearts on, uh, the, he, the translators use the word lust. It means to cultivate or decide, and it creates a mental fortress, and it's, and it's set up in our hearts, in our, in our minds, and we enthrone that that belief. And the name is critical. This is the actual way that the adversary receives his worship. Because we allow the teachers that we listen to to enthrone the false name on our hearts. And we, we have to turn away from all the false names. From uh, the Catholic organization, uh, catholic.org website, a headline is, is there, you can go see it, the Holy See stops the use of Yahweh in Catholic worship. It's not allowed. The CNS, or Catholic News Service, announced August 12, 2008, in a two-page letter to all Catholic bishops from the Vatican Congregation for Divine Worship and the Sacraments. Sacraments, where, where is that written? Addressed to the Episcopal conferences around the world. By directive of the Holy Father. Whoa, who is the Holy Father? Who is the set-apart one? Who is the sovereign of esteem? Uh-oh, they've already tricked us here, see? They think that a man is the set-apart father. In accord with the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, this congregation, as regards the translation and the pronunciation in liturgical setting of the divine name signified by the sacred tetragrammaton, that means the four letters that we looked at earlier, the name of Almighty G.O.D. expressed by the Hebrew tetragrammaton and rendered in Latin by the word D-O-M-I-N-U-S is to be rendered into any given vernacular by a word equivalent in meaning. It's not to be used. That, that translation, I mean, uh, there's no transliteration of the name allowed. Now he's down there kissing the Quran. Anyway, not serene guard, two things. The name of Yahuwah and the word of Yahuwah, his instruction. Psalm 138, let's read that real quick again. I bow myself towards your set-apart hekel, that's temple, and give thanks to your name for your kindness and for your truth. For you have made great your word, your name above all. Number 6, 23 says, Speak to Aharon and to his son, saying, This is how you are to bless the children of Yisrael. Say to them, Yahuwah, bless you and guard you. Yahuwah, make his face shine upon you and show favor to you. Yahuwah, lift up his face upon you and give you peace. And this is emblematic of the, sh of the letter Sheen, you know, 
And that's uh, part of the priestly blessing of the high priest. Now, we're priests of the order of Melchizedek. In the battleground, the minds of men, the word is changed to wormwood by those teaching doctrines of the strange woman. We plead with people to come out of her. See, the supplanter, the imposter, has shifted and stolen not only the physical world, but also the words themselves of Yahuwah. And all of the credit that, and the esteem that is given to him is given to someone else. Now, it's done very, very carefully. The strange woman is Babel, or Mother C-I-R-C-E. That word is actually the origin of the word C-H-U-R-C-H. That's a, a King James thing. There can be only one. That's a little phrase from a movie uh, that Christopher Lambert was in, if some of you have seen it. And Sean Connery and Chuck Norris and Clint Eastwood are all pictured here. Who could it be? Well, there's three uh, cups here to decide from. There's many names of all the other pagan religions, but the three main religions, you know, if you want to call them religions, uh, they call the creator L-O-R-D, and we call him Yahuwah, and other people just call him Elohim. Uh, that's uh, actually the origin of that word. But it was actually used by uh, some pagans as a moon deity too. Now the war concerns not power, but identity. See, it's the identity that we're going after. And your identity is your name. If your name is, if you want it written in the scroll of life, then you'd like it to be accurate. You know, not like some masqueraded thing or something with a crust over it or hidden away or changed. But um, anyway, the, the name that's written in the scroll of life, your name, you wouldn't want that changed. Now, the identity of the creator has been stolen. Would you knowingly sell or promote counterfeit goods? Well, teachers are doing it all the time because they're promoting the counterfeit names, you know. In corporate religion, a counterfeit is being worshiped. A fallen being has stolen the identity of the true creator, making people believe that they're serving the true creator while using false names and changing the original words into wormwood. So there, if a stronghold would be, another way of looking at it would be believing something that's just not true. It's a stronghold. It's something that you've put in there in your heart, in your mind, and you're just going along with it and excusing it and saying, well, it's fake, but it's okay. He knows what I mean. He knows my heart. Well, an imposter, an identity thief, a deceiver, would you like to break that stronghold and come out of that, that box that you've imprisoned yourself in? Ecclesiastes 7 says, A good name is better than precious oil, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. That's good to know. You know, we've already overcome uh, the, our day of birth. We're here. So the day of one's death is even greater. And that's a good thing to look forward to, if you're prepared. Exodus 15 says, then Moshe and the children of Israel sang this song to Yahuwah and spoke, saying, I sing to Yahuwah, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. Yah is my strength and song, and he has become my deliverance. He is my El, and I praise him. Elohim of my father, and I exalt him. Yahuwah is a man of battle. Yahuwah is his name. Doesn't say anything about any other names. Now we of the covenant call to those who sit in darkness who are imprisoned. Now they've imprisoned their, their own hearts and minds because they sit in darkness because they don't have the name. When people read the scriptures, they can't understand them because they are using the wrong name. So he's not going to come down with fire and light a sacrifice in another name. He's going to use... He's going to do, light that fire in your heart, just like Elijah called down Yahuwah by using his name. When you do that, big time changes occur. And also, you become an enemy combatant, you know, of, of, the, of the adversary. Yeshayahu, or Isaiah 42, says, I, Yahuwah, 
have called you in righteousness and I take hold of your hand and guard you and give you for a covenant to a people for a light to the Gentiles to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. I am Yahuwah, that is my name. And my esteem I do not give to another, nor my praise to idols. Now at our immersion, our enlistment point, that's when we join the army, the army of Yahuwah. If we're joining another army, it's not going to be a good thing. We won't be protected. The fire won't fall, you know. But we'll feel like we're really doing the right thing because the words, they have power. But the thing of it is, Yahushua is not in us. Now, our enlistment point in the war is calling upon the name of Yahushua. When our true, our, our, our true redeemer for deliverance. And the washing of the word of Yahuwah releases us from the captivity and the control of the evil woman, Babo, which is also known as C-H-U-R-C-H or C-I-R-C-E. That's when we pledge ourselves to become combatants. And the indwelling of Yahushua's spirit comes upon us and then we're armored. We're actually figuratively wearing armor. And the tip of the sword that we hold, which is the only offensive weapon we have, is the, the tip of the sword involves his name. I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, no one else. Now, we put on our armor of light. It, we can read about it at Romans 13, 12, and we enlist as a combatant in the war in heaven. This war is still going on. Now, the word for, in Hebrew for war is milkama, and it actually means in the sense of fighting, a battle, and that's uh, generally a war or a fight. The Nazarim are involved in this fight, and the strongholds are what we're actually trying to combat. It's the strongholds of, of men's minds. Revelation 12, verse 9 says, And the great dragon was thrown out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who leads all the world astray. He was thrown to the earth, and his messengers were thrown out with him. And in 17, it says, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to fight with the remnant of her seed, those guarding the commands of Elohim and possessing the witness of Yahushua, Messiah. Now, the woman, Yisrael, is the bride of Yahuwah, and we're, in, we're restoring people to the covenant. But the strange woman, C-I-R-C-E or whatever, is riding the beast. And we can see a picture here of actually the operation of how that happens. You've got the false teachers with the power of the government behind them. And it's actually a uni unity there. Because this man was the same religion as these men, you know. And they were enforcing their doctrines. The first commandment is the key, like I, I mentioned before. Deuteronomy 5, 6 says, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. Yahuwah wants us to be aware of the scheme of our enemy, and his name is the key that identifies him so that we know who we worship. That's why his name is the key of knowledge. They removed the name from it, it, after the exile uh, to Babylon, the uh, Yahudim, that were the southern tribes, uh, came back to the land and they removed the, the uh, permission to use the name aloud. And the only one that was able to use it was the high priest. And that was done, I think, once a year on Yom Kafar. Now, Yeshayahu or Isaiah 42 says, I am Yahuwah, that is my name. And my esteem I do not give to another, nor my praise to idols. Anaki Yahuwah Eloheinu. I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. Satan assumes the credentials of Yahuwah to divert all honor toward himself. He may not take the name, take Yahuwah's name. He can say Yahuwah's name, but he can't take it for himself. That permission is obviously not given. But uh, we see the commandment declares, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. And he says this to differentiate himself from all the imposters who might steal his identity. So the lying deceiver seeks to display himself in the hearts and minds of mankind in the place of Yahuwah, taking credit for all creation. Uh, if you're uh, involved in a Christian, a Christian denomination, do you feel like there's something missing? 
Do you, have you ever felt when you were in a Christian assembly that there was something missing, some missing force, a power that just wasn't there? It didn't ignite your heart. In Jeremiah 23, verse 25 through 27, it says, I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy falsehood in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. Till when shall it be in the heart of the prophets, the prophets of falsehood and prophets of the deceit of their own heart who try to make my people forget my name by their dreams, which everyone relates to his neighbor as their fathers forgot my name for B-A-A-L. That would be the Lord. So the word B-A-A-L, you need to look up if you're not familiar with it, in a Webster's or an encyclopedia, you'll see that it means, in English, it, it means the Lord. And they wrestle very, very hard to keep their error. So uh, if you receive a love for the truth, then this will burn into your heart and it'll be a, a hard stronghold to overcome. Second Thessalonians says in chapter two, the coming of the lawless one, that's the coming of the lawless one, predominantly in the men's hearts, is according to the working of, of Satan, with all power and signs and wonders of falsehood, and with all deceit of unrighteousness in those perishing, because they did not receive the love of the truth in order for them to be saved. And for this reason, Elohim sends them a working of delusion for them to believe the falsehood in order that all should be judged who did not believe the truth, but have delighted in the unrighteousness. Now the Torah guards us against the tongue of the strange woman. The tongue of the strange woman is teaching the things out of that golden cup that she holds of abominations. Proverbs 6 says, These six matters Yahuwah hates, and seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands shedding innocent blood, a heart devising wicked schemes, and feet quick to run to evil, a false witness breathing out lies, and one who causes strife among brothers. My son, watch over your father's command and do not forsake the Torah of your mother. Bind them on your heart always and tie them around your neck. When you are walking about, it leads you. And when you lie down, it guards you. Even in our sleep, the Torah guards us. And when you have woken up, it talks to you. For the command is a lamp and the Torah a light and reproofs of discipline a way of life to guard you against an evil woman from the flattering tongue of a strange woman. Now that's a literal strange woman too, but it's also speaking of the errors and the lies of the, of the strange woman called C-I-R-C-E or Baba. And there's a footnote here for Psalm 119 verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Now the Torah is alive because it's a living person. Psalm 119, 104 says, from your orders I get understanding, therefore I have hated every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn and I confirm to guard your righteous right rulings. I have been afflicted very much. O oh, Yahuwah, revive me according to your word. And Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of Elohim is living. The word is the sword. It's the sword in our armor. And working and sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting through even to the dividing of being and spirit and of joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Second Chronicles 16 verse 9 says, For the eyes of Yahuwah diligently search throughout all the earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is perfect to him. You have acted foolishly in this, so from now on, you shall have battles. Psalm 44 says, If we have forgotten the name of our Elohim or spread forth our hands to a strange mighty one, will not Elohim search this out? For he knows the secrets of the heart. So where is the battlefield? It's not in the world. It's in our minds. Romans 12, 2 says, Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you prove what is that good and well-pleasing and perfect desire of Elohim. 
Now, you have to overcome the programming of the world. That's the cosmos. And uh, he can search your mind, just like Spock here can search the thoughts of your inner mind. Uh, it's a mind probe. Anyway, Romans 12, 2 says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you prove what is that good and well-pleasing and perfect desire of Elohim. So uh, the satan satanic programming, you know, if, if we instill the wrong, the errors into our minds, if we allow that, you know, then we're, we're, not let, we're not really wearing the armor because if you're wearing the armor, if Yahuwah is in you, you, you've been immersed in his name, then you have the ability to put that shield up and stop those lies, you know, those fiery darts. So the weapons that are used against us primarily are the same weapons that the adversaries always used, even from the Garden of Eden. You can find these three weapons, pleasure, possessions, and position. In 1 John, or 1 Yahukunin 2, it says, do not love the world, that means the things of the world, the, any of the things, nor that which is in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him, because all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away in the lust of it. But the one doing the desire of Elohim remains forever. Now the world is the word cosmos, and it means the world system. And that includes the religious little beliefs that people have. Now the, the word lust is actually the word epithumia, and it means the heart's desire. It means what, what your heart goes after. And if it goes after these three things, pleasure or possessions, or position, then you're in serious trouble. And that's why we see the political systems of the world in such a horrible state, because all of those people are, circus, are actually going after, their hearts are going after those three things. You can see it happening all the time. In the uh, political arena, it, doesn't just, it isn't just confined to our government, it's confined to all the governments, you know. Come out of her. Babel, or C-I-R-C-E. The strange woman, Proverbs 6, 24 talks about. In Revelation 18, it says, And after this I saw another messenger coming down from the heaven, having great authority, and the earth was lightened from his esteem. And he cried with a mighty voice, saying, Babel, the great, is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, and a haunt for every unclean and hated bird, because all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her whoring, and the sovereigns of the earth have committed whoring with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the power of her riotous living. And I heard another voice from the heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. Now, uh, Babel is C I R C E, naming herself C H U R C H. We of the covenant call to those who sit in the darkness of their own stronghold. Yeshiyahu 42, again, I'm going to read it. You can see it. It says, I, Yahuwah, have called you in righteousness, and I take hold of your hand and guard you and give you for a covenant to a people for a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. I am Yahuwah. That is my name. And my esteem I do not give to another, nor my praise to idols. And this is a Hebrew text here. It says, Shema Yisrael, Yahuwah, Eloheinu, Yahuwah, Akkad. That's here, O Yisrael, Yahuwah, our Elohim, Yahuwah is one. Now, the question that we asked at the beginning was, who is the sovereign of esteem? Who does he want to give his esteem, what do we, who do we give our esteem to? He says he will not give it to another. So he's Yahuwah, and he links that with his esteem. Now watch this. Overthrowing the strongholds of thought, because the battlefield is in the hearts and minds. For In 2 Corinthians 10, it says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not fight according to the flesh. 
For the weapons we fight with are not fleshly, but mighty in Elohim for overthrowing strongholds, overthrowing reasonings, and every high matter that exalts itself against the knowledge of Elohim, taking captive every thought to make it obedient to the Messiah and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is complete. So if you receive his spirit, you receive his life. And in Mark 16, it says later, he appeared to the 11 as they sat at the table and he, he, reproached, he reproached their unbelief and their hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he was raised. And he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the good news to every creature. He who has believed and has been immersed shall be saved, but he who has not believed shall be condemned. And in John, or you know, in 20, it, in verse 20, it says, And having said this, he, he showed them his hands and his side. The taught ones therefore rejoiced when they saw the master. Then Yahushua said to them again, Peace be to you. And the Father has sent, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And having said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the set-apart spirit. Now the army, uh, armor that we wear is the spirit the indwelling of the mind of Yahuwah, which Yahushua brings with us. And the reign of Yahuwah is within you. That's where the throne, we enthrone him. We, op we get off of our throne and we put the true creator on our, on our throne. Luke 17 says, And having been asked by the Pharisees when the reign of Elohim would come, he answered them and said, The reign of Elohim does not come with intent watching. Nor shall they say, look over here or look there. For look, the reign of Elohim is within you. The objective is winning hearts, not land. The battlefield is in the hearts and minds of men and women. We capture territory each time that we are used by Yahushua to guide a new recruit into the truth, re releasing them from the prison and they are immersed into the name. Immersion is their pledge of allegiance to Yahusha in battle, and they're now soldiers in the war, and when they're fully trained, they're equipped for warfare, and the weapons of love and, and peace. Now, if you set your heart on something, that's where we get the word epithumia, or lust. If you set your heart on something, you've got to seek him in, in, that, in that kind of degree of, of enthusiasm. In Deuteronomy 32, we see this. At, at verse 45, it says, And when Moshe ended speaking all these words to Yisrael, he said to them, Set your heart on all the words which I warn you today, so that you command your children to guard to do all the words of this Torah. And in the book of Joshua, or Yahushua, chapter 24, he says in verse 15, And if it seems evil in your eyes to serve Yahuwah, Choose for yourselves this day whom you are going to serve, whether the mighty ones which your father served that were beyond the river or the mighty ones of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But I and my house, we serve Yahuwah. <laughs> See? And the translators have changed that for you. They say, the Lord, you know. The enemy is a strange woman. And... It involves human traditions, and they excuse it that way. In Proverbs 6, it says, My son, watch over your father's command, and do not forsake the Torah of your mother. Bind them on your heart always. Tie them around your neck. And when you're walking about, it leads you. When you, when you lie down, it guards you. See, when you're asleep, sometimes you might remember having a dream. And in the dream, you go, wait a minute, that's against Torah. It happens to me all the time. Anyway, it, it, it's, it's about this strange woman, you know, the doctrines of this woman holding the cup. Revelation 17 says, And the woman whom you saw is that great city having sovereignty over the sovereigns of the earth. That word sovereignty is interesting. Now watch this. Be strong and courageous because the water of life is with you. In Joshua or Yahushua chapter 1, it says, Only be strong and very courageous to guard, to do according to all the Torah which Moshe, my servant, commanded you. 
Do not turn from it right or left so that you act wisely wherever you go. Do not let this book of the Torah depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you guard to do according to all that is written in it. For then you shall make your way prosperous and act wisely. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid nor be discouraged. For Yahuwah your Elohim is with you wherever you go. The war in heaven is waged to win hearts. And remember, mind, heart, and lamp are the same thing. And, and, and his half-brother James, or Jacob, says in, verse, in chapter 4, Draw near to Elohim, and he shall draw near to you. Cleanse hands, sinners, and cleanse hearts, you double-minded. Sounds just like Eliyahu. Exodus 20 says, In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I shall come to you and bless you. Mark 8, verse 38 says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinning generation, of him, the son of Adam, also shall be ashamed when he comes in the esteem of his father with the set-apart messengers. He said, I am with you over and over and over. And Yirmiyahu or Jeremiah 46 and Verse 27 says, But as for you, do not fear, O my servant Jacob, talking to the tribes of Israel, and do not be discouraged, O Israel, for look, I am saying to you from afar, and your descendants from the land of their captivity, and that's where we are, and Jacob shall return and shall have rest and be at ease with no one disturbing. Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant. He's talking to us, declares Yahuwah, for I am with you, though I make a complete end of all the Gentiles to which I have driven you. Yet I do not make a complete end of you, but I shall reprove you in right ruling and by no means leave you unpunished. The armor is Yahushua within a, with, a, with us, guarding and guiding and protecting. <laughs> Ephesians 6 talks about our armor. For the rest, my brothers, be strong in the master and in the mightiness of his strength. Put on the complete armor of Elohim for you to have power to stand against the schemes of the devil because we do not wrestle against the flesh and blood but against principalities, against authorities, and against the world rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual matters of wickedness in the heavenlies. Because of this, take up the complete armor of Elohim so that you have power to withstand in the wicked day and having done all to stand. So the, the war in heaven is raging right now. And we're going to look at a real quick at a Hebrew word for army. Saba. And it actually means a mass of persons, especially regularly organized for war. And the important question that was asked at Psalm 24. And we are, we've asked this question earlier, but we're going to see what this question is again. Psalm 24 verse 7 through 10 says lift up your heads O gates and be lifted up you everlasting doors and let the sovereign of esteem come in who is this sovereign of esteem yahuwah strong and mighty yahuwah mighty in battle lift up your heads O you gates even lift up you everlasting doors and let the sovereign of esteem come in who is this sovereign of esteem? Yahuwah Sabah. That means Yahuwah of armies. He is the sovereign of esteem. Salah. Now that word Salah is, the, is an emphasis. Do you understand? It's very highly important. And every knee will bow. In Philippians 2 verse 10 and Romans 14 11, it says every knee will bow. And every heart, every, every mouth confess that Yahushua is Elohim. What shall we do? Acts 2, 37, the crowd said, having, and having heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Kepha and the rest of the emissaries, men, brothers, what shall we do? And Kepha said, repent and let each of you, each one of you be immersed in the name of Yahushua. Messiah for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the set apart spirit. So we, we say repent for the kingdom of Yahuwah draws near which is the message that he was saying. It, it says in the translations the kingdom of heaven. You know the kingdom of Shamayim. 
But what is the kingdom? Who is the sovereign of esteem? It's the kingdom of Yahuwah is what it is. And we're saying, Baruch, Haba, Bashem, Yahuwah. Blessed is the one coming in the name of Yahuwah. And uh, again, it says, no man is going to stand against you, before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moshe, so I am with you. He's saying this to the successor of Moshe in chapter one. I do not fail you nor forsake you. Ahaya, Asher, Ahaya. I am who I am. I am who I am. I am Yahuwah, that is my name. Yeshayahu, chapter 42. And see, I am with you always until the end of the age. So we must seek Yahuwah with all our heart. Jeremiah 29 is really exciting. For I know the plans I am planning for you, declares Yahuwah, plans of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and expectancy. Then you shall call on me and shall come and pray to me, and I shall listen to you. And you shall seek me and shall find me when you search for me with all your heart. And I shall be found by you, declares Yahuwah, and I shall turn back your captivity. And I shall gather you from all the Gentiles, from all the places where I have driven you, declares Yahuwah. And I shall bring you back to the place from which I ex exiled you. Now, here's a modern parable that I, uh, just last week, Yahuwah woke me up in, in, in the middle of the night, gave me this, and it's called the touch of the physician. And first of all, parables are dark sayings. They're the meaning, the meaning of the elements is hidden from most people so that the comprehension isn't possible for outsiders to interpret. But here's the uh, meaning of the elements that you're gonna see. When I use the word hallmark, I'm meaning the outward sign or signal, the family crest or the primary trait. So a hallmark is something we'll be known by. And the name the, is the identity that specifically defines someone apart from all others. And a leper is metaphorically a sinner who's slowly dying a horrible death. And this represents every person in the world. Light is the Torah, the words, the instructions of Yahuwah by which every person is to live by. And in, the, in this parable, physicians in general are a general reference to human teachers that are promoting anti-Torah patterns. The physician that is in the parable is Yahusha himself, the light of the world. And the touch of the physician is the indwelling of the spirit of Yahusha, the well of living waters. And here's the, here's the parable. A land was filled with many leprous people, all having spent their wealth on physicians that could not heal them. They were hopeless and turned away from all physicians, considering them to be frauds. As one of the lepers lay dying, he prayed a final prayer that someone be sent to help the others to be cured and live normal, healthy lives. Immediately, a brilliant light enveloped him and a kind presence came into him. The light brought him joy, peace, and healing. He realized that Yahusha, the creator of all things, had healed him because he prayed for others, not himself. He had learned to love others more than his own life and had been begotten from above by the touch of the physician. Now, rising up in complete health of mind and body, the former leper went to share what had happened to him and told everyone the name of Yahusha healed him. Each leprous person who accepted the name of Yahusha received the healing light and arose to continue the work of sharing the name of the physician who delivers from death and is the light of life. Certain lepers who would not accept the words and receive the light became bitter and envious and began to malign the former lepers who worked among the leper community. They accused them of all kinds of shameful activities, evidenced by the fact that they associated with known lepers. As more and more healthy people heard about the work among the lepers, support for their work came in from all over the world. Kindness, encouragement, and love propelled a great restoration. Love became the hallmark between all those who accepted the light and they gave praise and honor to the touch of the physician. 
That's the indwelling of the spirit of Yahushua that took away the leprosy of death and brought his life into the darkness of a dying world. And we read about this in part in John or Yehuchan in chapter 3. For Elohim so loved the world that he gave his only brought forth son, so that everyone who believes in him should not perish but possess everlasting life. For Elohim did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe is judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only brought forth son of Elohim. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their works were wicked. For everyone who is practicing evil matters hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But the one doing the truth comes to the light so that his works are clearly seen that they have been wrought in Elohim. So our commission as Nazarene was given to us in Matthew 28. Therefore go and make taught ones of all the nations, immersing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the set-apart spirit, teaching them to guard all that I have commanded you. And see, I am with you always until the end of the age. So we teach them the name and teach them the Torah. And we're saying it, Baruch, Haba, Bashem, Yahuwah. That's the end of it. 